ओ नम शिवाय ओ नम शिवाय ओ नम शिवाय ओ नमस्ते so this sutra this adhikarna is about the fact that the upanishads are the source of knowledge about brahman and simply by understanding this knowledge one can realize brahman as the self and that this is the whole purport and purpose of the vedic literatures now the opponent the vrittikaras those who want to make a difference that's literally what vrittikara means making a difference they want to make duality out of brahman by saying that brahman is the object of meditation but brahman if we read the upanishads closely Brahman is not presented as a direct object of meditation because it can't be it's imperceptible because it is the perceiver so because the perceiver can't perceive itself Brahman is presented for meditation indirectly through some metaphor some symbol and we've been over this in the past episodes of this series but you know those vrittikaras they just persist <laughs> and so we're going to see here a dialogue leading to the main presentation of shankaracharya's commentary on this adhikarna objection by the vedantists even a simple statement about an entity as in such sentences this is not a snake it is a rope is seen to serve some purpose by removing the fear occasioned by the error similarly here also the upanishadic sentences will by virtue of their imparting instruction about the transcendental self serve the purpose of removing the error of thinking oneself as a transmigrating soul opponent this can be so if like the removal of the error of the snake on a rope on hearing the nature of the rope the error about transmigration is removed as soon as one hears of the nature of brahman but as a matter of fact it is not removed for it is seen that even in the case of one who has heard of brahman such characteristics of a soul in bondage as happiness sorrow etc persist just as before besides it is seen that reflection and meditation occurring after hearing are enjoined in the self is to be heard of reflected on and profoundly meditated upon brihadaranyakopanishad 245 therefore brahman is to be accepted as having been presented by the scriptures for meditation in a context of injunction about meditation they just don't give up do they <laughs> well they have to present brahman like that because they can't realize brahman because they think brahman is an object of meditation but brahman in reality never becomes an object of anything even a process of knowledge or perception such as meditation meditation means fixing the mind on an object and because brahman is always a subject meditation on brahman is impossible can't happen in a million years but they have to see it like that because they cannot get rid of the idea of an object and so all of their interpretations are thrown askew because of this fundamental misunderstanding of brahman and they bring up that quote again from brihadaranyaka 245 which we showed in a previous episode to be 
actually in a context of meditating on symbols of Brahman. Remember the quote, one does not love the wife for the sake of the wife, but for the sake of the self. One does not love the husband, the brahmanas, the kshatriyas, the all for its own sake. One loves the all for the sake of the self. And this is the existential truth. Look at your own life. Huh? We see beings and other phenomena as attractive only because of the presence of the self. As soon as the self leaves a body at the time of death, the body becomes unattractive. Huh? Bury it, burn it, get rid of it, whatever, before it starts to smell. <laughs> so we don't really worship the body. We don't really love the body. We love the body because of the self. So actually, we love the self. And the self is to be loved, to be beloved in all forms, because the self is present in all forms. This is the real meaning of that Upanishadic quote. So now, the Vedantists are going to come back with the major presentation of the meaning of this sutra, that the knowledge of the self of Brahman is derived from the Upanishads. Vedantan. With regard to this, we say, not so, for the results of action and the knowledge of Brahman are different. By virtuous deeds are meant those physical, vocal, and mental actions which are well known in the Vedas and Smritis, and an inquiry about which has been set forth in the aphorism, hence thereafter should be commenced an inquiry about virtuous deeds. Jaimini Sutra 111. Even vices like injury are to be inquired into with a view to shunning them, for they too are revealed in the Vedic sentences expressing prohibition. Happiness and sorrow are the results of these two, of virtue and vice, consisting of good and evil, with regard to which the Vedic texts of injunction and prohibition are authoritative. And these results, arising from the contact of senses and objects, are familiarly experienced by all creatures ranging from Brahma to the motionless, trees, etc. The gradation of happiness among embodied beings, starting from men and ending with Brahma, is known from the Upanishads, Taitriya Upanishad 2, 8, Brihadaranyak Upanishad 4, 3, 33. From that again is known a gradation in its cause, which is virtue. From a gradation of virtues is known a gradation among the persons qualified for them. It is a familiar fact that competence is evaluated in terms of aspiration and ability. As, for instance, the performers of sacrifices, etc., proceed along the northern course after death in accordance with the excellence in their meditation and concentration of mind, whereas they move along the southern course starting from smoke as a result of performing ishta, purta, and datta. And there's a footnote. The northern course, also known as the path of gods, and the southern course, or the path of manes, Ishta, Agnihotra, and Vishvadeva sacrifices, austerity, truthfulness, study, hospitality, etc. Purta, digging of wells, construction of rest houses, temples, etc. Datta, charity, protection of the weak, non-injury, etc. So all these are actions. The scripture provides actions leading to virtue, in other words, good karma. And that good karma takes one along a path after death to a destiny or destination, 
according to the degree of its purity and power. So ordinary austerities, such as digging wells, offering hospitality to strangers, etc., etc., these good works, charity in general, is necessary for a human society based on wisdom instead of animal society based on greed like we have today. These gifts to humanity in general lead one along the southern course, which goes to the moon and leads to rebirth in a pious human family. But those meditational austerities leading to realization of Brahman result in moving along the northern course or the path of the sun to Brahma Loka and beyond to Brahman itself. These are the two paths of the virtuous beings which are revealed in the last chapter of Brahma Sutra, which everyone should read because it clarifies the whole subject of destiny after death and who gets to go to which level of heavens and so on and so forth. And of course, you know, the evil personalities who indulge in all kinds of harm uh, don't even see the path of the moon. They go directly to the house of Yama, where they are assigned to different hells according to their nefarious activities. And then they have to come back in animal births or even plants, non-moving species. There again, in the world of the moon, a gradation of happiness and the means of its attainment is known from the text, residing there as long as the result of action, producing the enjoyment, lasts, they come back. Chandogya Upanishad 5.10.5 Similarly, the little happiness existing in a graded order among creatures ranging from men to the immobile and hellish ones is known to be the product of virtuous deeds themselves, about which the Vedic texts are authoritative. So also, from a perception of a gradation of sorrow among higher and lower embodied beings, it becomes clear that there is a gradation in their causes, which are the vicious deeds prohibited by the authoritative Vedic texts, and that there is also a gradation among the performers of these deeds. Thus, it is well known from the Vedic texts, smritis, and reasoning that this transient world is constituted by a gradation of happiness and sorrow, that this gradation occurs to persons who are subject to such defects as ignorance, and that it comes to them after their birth and in accordance with the gradation of their virtuous and vicious deeds in earlier life. In support of this, there is the Vedic text. For an embodied being, there can be no eradication of happiness and sorrow, to be sure. Chandogya Upanishad 8.12.1, which is a corroborative restatement, Anuvada, of the nature of the world described earlier. And from the denial of any contact with happiness and sorrow as contained in the text, Happiness and sorrow do not touch one who is definitely bodiless. It follows that it is with regard to emancipation, which is the same as bodilessness, that the denial is made of its ever being the result of virtuous deeds, which the Vedic texts are the only means of knowledge. For if it be a product of virtuous deeds, for example, meditation, there can be no denial of its contact with happiness and sorrow. In other words, happiness and sorrow is endemic in dualistic life, whether it be on earth or in the lower heavens or even in hellish conditions. That's conditioned existence. That's what conditioned means, conditioned by happiness and distress. But when one attains liberation, there's no more happiness and distress because one has become one with the universal 
Brahman. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.